And we are going to wait, uh, Tony, a couple of more minutes yeah. because uh, you know, people are finishing lectures and, uh, sure, yes, yes, yes. and there, is, uh, there is a phase transition changing between uh, virtual uh, virtual rooms. Yeah, right. So are you actually conducting lectures in person? Mm, not at the moment. It's no. Everything is, uh, is virtual by, uh, by Zoom and other media. Yes. I'm not sure what is going to happen uh, next uh, next trimester. I think we are going to still uh, be doing a uh, lecture by uh, by Zoom. Yes. I believe here um, at UIUC, um, all lectures have to be off in the in the fall. All lectures have to be offered in person, but there is also arrangements for people to follow them remotely. I see. And uh, are you currently teaching? <laughs> I'm retired, technically. I see. <laughs> it uh, doesn't seem to me I'm any less busy than I was, but uh, I think <laughs> that I, I am retired. But, uh, but, but you can teach if you want, no? Um, I probably could. I have not so far been asked to particularly. No. I see. And actually, I do think that I have sufficient other commitments <laughs> that sure. might be a bit difficult. Sure, I see. So, I think I, if, if if it's okay with everybody, also with uh, with Tony, I'm going to uh, well, I'm going to start. Okay. Um, so welcome everybody to to Iztapalapa, to Mexico Mexico City, virtually of course. My name is uh, Isaac Perez Castillo, and I'm the organizer of the seminar series of complex systems at the Department of Physics at the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana Casa Abierta al Tiempo. As you may remember, during this uh, first season, we have, we have had the opportunity to enjoy listening to many towering scientific figures from different areas of physics. Uh, and today, with the help of uh, Ivan Pompa and David Hernandez, organizers of our seminar series of our graduate program, I thought it would be appropriate to close this uh, seminar series before summer break uh, with another brilliant scientist, Nobel laureate Tony Leger. So please let me very briefly introduce the speaker of today. Sir Anthony James Leggett, born in Camberwell, South, South London, is a theoretical physicist and professor emeritus at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Professor Leggett is widely recognized as a world leader in the theory of low temperature physics and his pioneering work on superflu uh, superfluidity uh, was recognized by the 2003 Nobel Prize in Physics. He has shaped theoretical understanding of normal and superfluid helium, helium liquids and strongly coupled superfluid. He set directions from, uh, for research in quantum physics of macroscopic dissipative systems and used condensed systems to test the foundations of quantum mechanics. Regarding his, uh, his graduate studies, I, I, I would like to briefly mention that he, he went to Belial uh, College, Oxford in 1954 to start uh, doing a degree in classics. And after that, after completing his first degree in classics, he, uh, he did a second degree, this time in physics. Uh, at Merton College, Oxford, under the supervision of uh, Dirk Der Haar. His uh, tentatively assigned thesis topic was some problems in the theory of many, many body uh, systems, which left him a considerable latitude uh, to pursue a wide research uh, of uh, wide uh, areas of interest. Professor Leggett spent a period of one year from August of 1964 to August 1965 as a postdoctoral researcher a research fellow, sorry, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Surrounded by prominent figures such as David Pines, John Bardeen, Gordon Bain, and Leo Kalanov. He then spent a year in the group of Professor Takeo Matsubara at uh, Kyoto University in Japan. And after one most, uh, more postdoctoral uh, year, spending, uh, spending some time between Oxford, Harvard, and Illinois, he took up a lectureship at the University of Sussex, where he spent uh, the majority of the next 15 years of his career. And also during that time, he spent some time in Japan at the University of Tokyo, and also the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasi, Ghana. In the early uh, 1982, he accepted an offer from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, to take uh, the MacArthur chair. He arrived at Urbana, uh, sometime in 1983, and he has been there ever since. 
Of course, as you know uh, very well, regarding his awards and honors, uh, Professor Leggett is a member of the National, National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosoph uh, Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Russia Academy of Sciences, the Indian National Science Academy. He is also a fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, he's a fellow of the American Physical Society, the American Institute of Physics, and a life fellow of the Institute of Physics. And of course, as you know the, very well, he was awarded uh, the 2003 Nobel Prize in Physics, together with uh, Gitborn and Abrikosov for pioneering uh, contributions in, uh, to the theory of superconductors and superfluids. He's uh, also an honorary fellow of the Institute of Physics, and he was appointed Knight Commander of the Order of the British Empire in the 2004 Queen's Birthday Honors for Services to Physics. Of course, he has also many, many prizes, but uh, maybe we should le let the, the speaker of today uh, give his, his seminar. So, Professor Tony Leggett, uh, Tony, it's a great honor to have you with us today. The floor is yours, so please take it, take it away. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Isaac, for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, the talk I'm going to give you today is roughly what I gave at the Nobel Ceremonies in Stockholm in 2003, though I have uh, updated a little in places. So let's start with some prehistory. Uh, helium comes in, in form of two stable isotopic species. There's helium-4, which is relatively common, and um, helium-3, which has uh, actually only uh, existed in any quantity on Earth um, in the last uh, 50 years or so, um, because of the, actually because um, of, oddly enough, nuclear weapons. When, when a nuclear weapon decays, the tritium decays into helium-3, and that is actually the source of much of our helium-3 here on Earth. Anyway, um, it's been known for um, a long time, uh, since the late 30s, that the isotope helium-4, the more common isotope, becomes superfluid below uh, about two degrees Kelvin, two degrees absolute. But what about the, uh, the less common species, helium-3? This actually is believed to be a fermion, and I'll explain in a moment what that means, and it uh, it, so it uh, has this in common with the electrons in metals. Electrons in metals, of course, have been uh, at least implicitly known since uh, ancient times, and they are uh, obviously electrically charged. Uh, helium-3 um, has only been around since about 1950 and uh, is electrically neutral. However, they do have in common, they're both particles of, uh, the the um, electrons and metals and the atoms of, of liquid helium-3 are both particles of spin a half and therefore obey so-called Fermi statistics. And what this means is that at any given temperature, um, if you plot the number of particles per state um, as a function of the energy of that state, it's really pretty boring. The, um, the lowest energy states are all occupied with one uh, electron per site. Um, fer fermions, that's the particles of spin a half, are very xenophobic. They hate to, in fact, they won't tolerate having more than one particle um, per state. And so you do put one particle in the lowest energy states um, uh, until you get up to uh, an energy when you've basically accommodated all the rest of the particles. And that is that energy is called the Fermi energy. And so the distribution has a little structure, as you see from the, uh, uh, from the picture, around that point. But, um, uh, but most of the electrons are really not doing anything particularly interesting. So that's the picture which we've had for a long time for the um, non-interacting gas fermions, um, and that uh, does seem to describe, not surprisingly, that uh, seems to describe the um, state of um, electrons in metals down to, uh, let us say, 20 degrees absolute, and, um, and helium-3 uh, down to a few millimeters. 
I, I was a bit puzzled that it was that that simple non interacting picture worked so well. And some light was shed on this by Landau in his um, theory of a degenerate Fermi liquid. And basically, Landau pointed out that um, in the normal phase, at least, interactions don't really change the picture qualitatively. They make some quantitative changes, but uh, basically the behavior of a degenerate Fermi liquid, even with strong interactions, is pretty similar to that of a, a non-interacting Fermi gas. Uh, so it wasn't particularly, it wasn't any mystery then that liquid helium-3 did seem to be behaving qualitatively much like a non-interacting Fermi gas. Uh, that is, appropriately speaking, according to the picture that we've shown. However, it's known that the electrons in metals, uh, which have a, a Fermi temperature of somewhere between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5 degrees Kelvin, um, some metals um, uh, below about 20 degrees Kelvin uh, show superconductivity. Um, that is essentially, truly speaking, the ability to carry electrical current um, without any voltage imposed. And so people began to speculate that in helium-3, where the Fermi temperature is much lower, it's about five, 5 degrees absolute, if you went to a low enough temperature, say about 10 to the minus 3K, roughly correspondingly to, to metals, then you might find, well, you'd not find superconductivity because that requires the uh, the um, electrons to be electrically charged. The helium at three atoms are not charged, but you might find a related phenomenon, uh, superfluidity, which would be qualitatively similar to the superfluidity in helium-3. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, so, um, uh, so uh, uh, superconductivity has been around, uh, um, uh, experimentally now for more than 100 years. And um, there have been some very uh, interesting um, and important theories of what's going on there. Uh, the first real theory of superconductivity, which enabled one to actually um, do anything quantitative, was a phenomenological theory due to um, uh, Ginsburg, Landau, Abrikosov, and others. Um, in the years between 1950 and 1955. And that relied on the idea of a macroscopic wave function. Um, Ginsburg and Landau called the wave function of a superconductor a macroscopic wave function, but they never really explained what they meant by macroscopic. And I'm not even sure they themselves really understood what they meant by it. But we'll see later that, uh, in fact, we we do know nowadays, in some sense, what it means. Um, this, however, was a phenomenological theory. Um, in 1957, um, my former colleagues, Bardeen, Cooper and Schrieffer, at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, where uh, I've been for the last um, 30 years, um, they produced a, um, a microscopic theory of superconductivity. And um, the crucial ingredient, a qualitative ingredient in that um, theory was the idea that electrons in a little shell very close to the Fermi energy, um, width around um, uh, Boltzmann's constant times the transition temperature, that's very, very small compared to the Fermi energy itself. So you're talking about a very small um, shell of energy right at the top of the distribution that these electrons would form what, what are called nowadays called Cooper pairs. Um, now, uh, it's tempting to think of Cooper pairs as like um, sort of, um, uh, molecules formed of two electrons. And in some sense, that's right. But one thing you really have to remember is that the two electrons which form a Cooper pair are very far apart, typically they're something like 10 to the 3 angstroms apart. And so between them, there are any number of other uh, electrons uh, forming their own Cooper pairs. It's a very highly collective phenomenon. 
And what, uh, one very crucial um, the uh, feature of the BCS theory, um, that is the theory of Bardeen and co-workers, is that all Cooper pairs, once they're formed, must behave in exactly the same way. And now um, it, it turns out that the so-called macroscopic wave function of Ginsburg and Landau is just the common center of mass wave function of all the Cooper pairs. And the sense in which it's macroscopic is that you have a macroscopic number of pairs occupying that pair wave function. Um, now, it's interesting that the fact that the, the, the electrons themselves are fermions and therefore extremely xenophobic doesn't actually work too, too much against this because two electrons, when you put them together, form a so-called boson. And bosons, as distinct from fermions, are extremely gregarious. So they love to have, to all have the same macroscopic wave function. So for, and one can, can actually make that idea more, more quantitative. It, it does work, in fact. However, um, the Ginsburg-Landau theory really only dealt with the behavior of the center of mass of the pairs. Um, in the context of this lecture, I'm going to be much more interested in the internal wave function of the pairs, that is the, if you like, the relative wave function of the two electrons which are forming the pair. In BCS theory, that internal wave function is rather trivial. Uh, in technical language, it's so-called 1s0 state. Um, so that means that the uh, wave function of two electrons forming the Cooper pair uh, is a spin singlet wave function. The, the standard form, multiplied by an orbital wave function, which is spherically symmetric, corresponding to zero relative angular momentum of the pair. So what that means is that the uh, Cooper pairs in the standard superconductor have no internal or orientation degrees of freedom. There's nothing, essentially, nothing interesting going on as regards the internal wave function. Next slide, please. Okay, now um, once uh, well, once helium three had been obtained in uh, reasonably uh, in large quantities enough for experiments, and people had 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 uh, had realised that in that at normal at temperatures of the order of one degree or so, it was behaving pretty much like the electrons in a normal metal. They started asking themselves, well, could something like Cooper pairing occur in liquid helium-3? But now, and then they immediately realized within a couple of years that, um, that there's actually an important difference between the electrons in metals and the um, atoms in helium-3, uh, quite apart from the fact that one is charged and the other is not. Um, in the electrons in metals, do you have a repulsion at short distances, the standard Coulomb repulsion? But in some sense, the Coulomb interaction is, is just the form, it just increases as one over the distance. And it really is, in some sense, rather mild. By comparison, the two atoms of helium 3, or for that matter, helium 4, have a um, very strong hard core repulsion. It's almost impossible to bring them together closer than a sort of atomic radius, which is something like three angstroms, uh, two or three angstroms. And it's only when you get to, to um, distances beyond that short distance that you find there's, a, in fact, a, 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 a small van der Waals attraction, which, however, is rather weak. And so if you're going to form your uh, Cooper pairs, you'd better form them so that the closest, the distance of closest approach um, is something of the order of this R0, something like three angstroms. On the other hand, you'd also, you would also have to form them for pairs near the Fermi energy. And that means that uh, uh, the momentum has, has got to be of the order of the Fermi momentum, that is the momentum corresponding to the Fermi energy. And if you put those together, you find that the angular momentum, which in, is basically the um, product of the Fermi momentum and the, uh, uh, the, the distance closest approach, R0, in units of h-bar, um, that cannot be zero. 
because they can't get Arbutus Coast to go. Um, so it must be something. Well, people thought uh, probably one or possibly two. Um, and now this is rather interesting because uh, depending on whether L really was um, two, which is an even number, or um, uh, well, say one, which is an odd number, the orbital, uh, the spin wave function is going to be different. This is because of the Pauli principle, which says that the total wave function of two fermions has to be antisymmetric. So what that leads to um, is that uh, uh, the uh, that if you um, have orbital angular momentum uh, zero, uh, which is or two, sorry, uh, which was one of the possibilities contemplated for field three, then uh, you form a the uh, spins in symmetric state. But if it were odd, so if it were one, which is another possibility, then the total spin would have to be one. In other words, you have a triple state. But in either case, uh, in either of these cases, if L is not equal to zero, then that means you have a relative or internal wave function of the pair. In other words, the pair has an orientational degree of freedom. And that's a very crucial difference from the Cooper pairs that form in superconductors, and that was realized way back as early as about 1960. Now, um, a very important, um, a very important couple of papers in the early 60s, um, one was by Anderson and Morell in 1961. Um, they actually explored in detail the case um, L equals two, which was thought at that time to be uh, the most um, probable case. Um, uh, and uh, incidentally, that uh, that exploration has turned out, in retrospect, to be rather useful in, in the context of, of the cuprate um, superconductors. But um, they also explore the special case of um, pairing with L equals 1. And that special case is where only up-up and down-down pairs form, which is not the only possibility, as we'll see. And they have the same orbital angular momentum in some direction L. Um, now, I'm not clear whether, and I've actually asked Phil Anderson this, this question more than once and never got a straight answer. Um, I'm not clear whether they chose that particular state for any particular reason, or whether it was just that it might look like the simplest state to consider. But anyway, they, they did analyze its properties in some detail. That property, as, as we'll see, has played a role later and is nowadays known as the anderson brinkman morell or ABM state. The um, physical states, uh, the, uh, the physical properties of the of this state are anisotropic, uh, both in orbital and in spin space. A second very important um, observation was made, actually made first <laughs> by the by a Russian um, physicist who's not terribly well known in the in the human field, named Yuri Dovin. He's actually mainly a plasma physicist, um, but he actually did make this observation, which was later um, rediscovered by Balian and Wertheimer in the U.S. Um, in the um, L equals one case, uh, you don't have to just consider up, up, and down, down. You can actually consider the third component. Which corresponds to total spin one, but the projection z s z equals zero, uh, and you can actually form Cooper pairs with all those three spin components. And if you do it right, you find that the vector angular momentum for any pair is just opposite to the vector spin um, uh, angular momentum, and uh, so the total j l plus s is zero. And that's uh, what's called the Balian Wertheimer state, since uh, Dobbin's work was not widely known by the time he did it. Um, all the physical properties of this state are isotropic, as you might uh, guess from the fact that j is equal to zero. And what both Dobbin and Balian and Wertheimer showed was that if you did have um, pairing with L equals one, then the uh, BW state would be more stable than any ESP. That's um, 
uh, state. An ESP state is one where you only have up, up, and down, down pairs, like the ABM state. So, uh, the, around, say, 1964, when I first got into the game, um, the theoretical expectation was that, um, yeah, it's indeed possible that liquid helium-3 may form Cooper pairs. And it wasn't entirely clear whether they would form with uh, L equals even, and therefore spin cigarette, or with L equals odd, in which case you ought to get the ballet and working state. In either state, though, the spin susceptibility should be reduced. And um, it's reduced, it's obviously reduced in the spin singlet state, just as it has happened in supercapacitors. Um, the reason it's reduced in the Balian Wertham state is that although the up, up, and down, down spins can react um, to a magnetic field, just as in the normal state, the SZ equals zero, that's the third component, the up, down, plus down, up, can't. It behaves more like a singlet. So in either case, um, chi would be reduced. And all the magnetic properties would be um, isotropic. The um, people, of course, did try to calculate what the transition temperature um, would be. And um, crudely speaking, what tended to happen in those days, we're talking now about the mid 60s, let's say, is that um, the theorists would, would uh, predict a transition temperature which was just a little below, perhaps by a factor of two, the lowest temperature the experimentalists had got to. The experimentalists would then go down that much in temperature and they wouldn't find um, any evidence for Cooper pairing, whereupon the theorists would go back and redo their calculations and, um, uh, 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 and set the predicted transition temperature again a bit lower, just a bit lower than the experimentalists had got to. Anyway, so this, uh, uh, this provided, of course, a, a a nice um, uh, incentive for the uh, for the, the experimentalists to keep trying to push the temperature lower. However, I, if I remember correctly, I haven't really checked this up recently, but um, in some time around the I think the spring of 1972, there came out a theoretical paper, which actually redid the calculation a bit more carefully than people had done previously, and they actually predicted a transition temperature of something like 10 to the minus 17 degrees, which was way beyond, of course, anything the experimentalists could ever get to. Luckily, I don't think too many experimentalists read that paper, so it didn't slow them down too much. Anyway, next slide, please. Yeah. So, um, the, uh, now we come to the, um, the, the interesting bit, as it were. Um, in 1971 to 2, um, Doug Osheroff, uh, Bob Richardson, um, and Dave Lee um, were doing um, experiments on a mixture of liquid and solid helium-3. As a matter of fact, I think their original motivation for doing these experiments was um, uh, to look for a uh, magnetic phase transition in the solid. But in order to cool the solid, they used polymerantric cooling, which requires a mixture of solid and, uh, uh, and liquid um, helium-3. So they had this mixture, and the only thing they could actually vary um, was the temperature, but then they could measure also the pressure. So, so these first experiments, which um, if I recall correctly, were done in 71 and before 72, um, they measured the pressurization P as a function of time. And it was Doug Osheroff who actually did, was doing these experiments in the basin of at Cornell. Um, and some night in, I think, October or November of uh, 1972, he actually found a couple of glitches in his pressurization theory. The glitches were very, very small, but nevertheless, they were large enough to be significant. And what Doug inferred, and what we now confirm, is that either the liquid or the solid, or both, were undergoing not one, but two phase transitions. Um, the first transition was at about 2.65 milliK, um, and uh, that's a second order phase transition, and that was from the normal phase into 
well, what, what is now called the A phase. Um, a second phase transition occurred um, at a lower temperature, about two milliDegrees absolute. Um, and this is a first order phase transition out of the A phase and into what we now call uh, the B phase. Well, this is sort of ambiguous. And at first sight, um, this, they thought the most obvious explanation for this was a phase transition in the solid, uh, which was, in fact, what they started to look for. However, shortly after that, joined by Willie Gully, they, um, uh, uh, they did a set of nuclear-magnetic resonance uh, ex experiments, again, on the mixture of the liquid and the solid. And what they measured uh, is standard NMR experiment. You have a, um, <coughs> a, you have a, a fixed a constant external field along the z-axis, as indicated. Um, you uh, have an RF field, which is transverse to the, the um, fixed uh, field. And you, what, basically what you do is that you vary the frequency of the RF field and you measure the absorption as a function of frequency. Uh, and from the absorption, you can then integrate that to get the um, susceptibility that you want and so on for it. Now, the first thing that they actually found, which I haven't listed here, um, was that, in fact, the um, phase transition was not going on in the solid, but in the liquid. And that seemed quite unambiguous from the shape of their, their curves. So that was the first interesting result. <laughs> the second result was that um, was concerned with both the susceptibility and the um, NMR frequent resonant frequency. Um, in the normal state, the um, susceptibility was independent of temperature, um, as Landau theory says it should be. Its value was um, just, just as expected from uh, degenerate Fermi liquid theory. So uh, nothing uh, particularly surprising about that. And what about the absorption, the NMR absorption? Well, that shows a very sharp peak at the free atom Larmor frequency, which is just the, um, the gyromagnetic ratio of the free helium three atom times the external field. And uh, that um, uh, is about 3000 Hertz per gauss. So the resonance frequency just scaled with the external field as indeed um, straightforward NMR theory says it should. Um, uh, however, um, when you get into the, the uh, uh, get below these two phase transitions, something much more interesting happens. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, the, uh, what happens to the susceptibility? Well, um, in the A phase, it looks as if um, it's simply the same as in the normal phase. As a matter of fact, we now know that, that isn't exactly true, but the difference is very, very slight. So essentially, the, uh, the A phase susceptibility is just the normal phase one. The B phase, in the B phase, the susceptibility drops discontinuously and then uh, continues to decrease. Uh, that's not particularly mysterious in view of the existing theory. Um, for example, uh, this would be consistent with the A phase being a so-called spin pairing phase, with only the up-up and down-down pairs formed, so there was no reduction in chi. Whereas the B phase could be either a spin singlet or the ballion wertheimer phase, uh, when, as we already saw, chi should be reduced. Uh, then the slight puzzle is why is any uh, ESP phase ever stable? Because uh, as we've seen, both Dolin and Balian and Wertheimer have shown that, in fact, the Balian and Wertheimer phase would always be more stable than that. In other words, you'd expect that the system just went straight from the normal phase um, into the B phase by a second order transition, but that clearly is not what's happening. But what is really puzzling is the resonance frequency. The resonance frequency stays very sharp, and that's a very important observation as you go from the normal phase into the A phase. And in the A phase, it starts to shift away from the, uh, the normal phase Larmor frequency in an upward direction. But it does not shift proportional to the external field. What happens is you get a so-called Pythagorean formula, 
the square of the resonance frequency um, is the sum of the squares of the original Larmor frequency plus some other quant frequency squared, which appears to be a function of temperature. And if we actually, um, just from the experimental data, to figure out um, what the, um, that, that uh, dependency is, we see that this extra term uh, goes as a constant times one minus T over TA, uh, the, uh, roughly, um, and the constant A is about five times 10 to the 10 hertz. Now, how could that happen? Let's first um, think of the most obvious suggestion. Since the, uh, the uh, two terms appear to be adding, not linearly, but according to Pythagoras, the natural assumption would seem to be that somehow the system manages to generate a field H0, which is perpendicular to the external field. And so the total field is just the Pythagorean um, combination of the two, and that will give you um, the resonance frequency which you see experimentally. The problem, however, um, how large does this transverse field have to be? Well, it turns out that to, to fit the experimental data, you need that H0 is about 30 Gauss. Where on earth could that 30 Gauss field come from? Um, helium is a very, very pure substance. It's impossible, just about impossible for any kind of impurities, whatever, into it at million degree temperatures. So it doesn't seem very plausible that there are any uh, magnetic impurities floating around. So the only um, apparent source of an extra field, which would be spin conser non-conserving, um, which is what you need, is the nuclear dipole-dipole interaction. And then you do vacuum envelope calculation and you remember that these helium-3 atoms can never get closer to one another than about the atomic uh, uh, hardcore radius, which is about two or three angstroms. And at that separation, the maximum associated field is less than one gauss. And you might think of all sorts of fancy ways of packing the, the various atoms together so as to get a slightly bigger field than that. But it really turns out that that really doesn't work at all. So this is a real, real puzzle. Now, at that particular point in time, we're talking now about, uh, I guess, June of 1973, um, the, um, I had been intending for some time to actually stop doing low temperature physics and go away and think about the foundations of quantum mechanics. But when I really started tossing this over in my mind, it um, seemed to me that this experimental result was so bizarre and unexpected that maybe it was a, an indication that under these very extreme conditions of very, not only very low temperatures, unprecedentedly low temperatures in fact in bulk matter, but also a, a very, very dense matter and so on and so forth, that quantum mechanics itself might actually break down. And so what I did was very uh, specifically and self-consciously, I set out to try to construct a proof that if standard quantum mechanics or standard statistical mechanics were working as advertised, then this experimental result just could not occur. So in other words, something really fundamental must have gone wrong. Well, because uh, as you probably know, it didn't quite work out that way. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there was a, a vast um, bulk of existing literature on, um, on NMR. I didn't know it. And my first resolution was that I was not going to find out about it, because it was clear that uh, this, at least as far as I knew at the time, um, this result was totally unprecedented and corresponded to like nothing that had been seen previously in bulk matter. That actually turns out not to be quite true, and I might come back to that later, but uh, that was what I thought. So I had to basically start off from scratch. Now, starting from scratch, I wanted to prove um, a rigorous 
to say that if quantum mechanics was right, uh, standard statistical mechanics was right, you could not get this result. So how do you prove something exact um, in a quantitative, in a, in a system as, as uh, complicated as a set of Hume three atoms? Well, there is one way of proving, at least to an extent, exact results known in many body physics, and that is sum rules. So my first thought was, okay, how do I, um, what, what can I actually get out of sum rules for this problem? It actually turns out I get something rather interesting. If I made the assumption, and this is an assumption, but it's it's based on on the experiment. I made the assumption that uh, you still, um, even in the A and B phases, only had a single sharp resonance, then the um, then you would in fact find a formula for the resonance frequency, which is indeed a Pythagorean formula of the type which is observed experimentally. And moreover, that extra term in the Pythagorean formula uh, was given apart from a factor of um, gamma squared chi to the minus one, it's given by the second derivative of the nuclear dipole energy with respect to a simultaneous rotation of all the spins. But it, then there are some high hand waving uh, arguments, fairly convincing arguments, which show that the second derivative with respect to the angle had to be of the same order of magnitude as the equilibrium. Um, nuclear dipole dipole moment itself. So, so from the experimental value of this extra Pythagorean term, we conclude that the expectation value of the dipole energy in the A phase had to be some constant k times 1 minus t over ta, and k had to be something like 10 to the minus 3 ergs per centimeter cube. Now, that doesn't sound very much, and indeed, when you compare it to the um, energy, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, say, I don't know, uh, say the um, other bulk energies in helium-3, it really is, is very tiny. Nevertheless, there is a um, very serious difficulty. Um, suppose that um, you have two, um, uh, two nuclear spins on, on two different atoms, and they are in some kind of um, orbital configuration relative to one another. Um, then the nuclear dipole dipole energy is going to depend on um, how they're oriented relative to one another. Um, this, for this purpose, you could just think of the nuclear spin as just like little magnets, and those of you who've played around with a little bar magnets in, in the lab know how they behave. If, the, if you try to, to set them parallel and side by side, they don't like it at all. That's a, a, a bad, that is, um, high energy configuration. On the other hand, if you set them end to end, they like it. That's good. That's, that's a low energy state. And so if you now translate this into, um, uh, into dynamics, as it were, it's much um, preferable for those um, two spins to, to tumble end over end rather than tumbling side by side. Well, fair enough. So there is some tendency for the spins to orient um, perpendicular to their um, relative angular momentum. But how strong is that tendency? This is where you really get in, get to trouble. The um, maximum uh, interaction energy at distance, even at the distance closest to approach, is still only about 10 to the minus 7 degrees Kelvin. And remember that although we're at low temperatures, the temperature is still um, several orders of magnitude greater than 10 to the minus 7, or like 10 to the minus 3. So what this uh, would say then is that the prefer preference for the good orientation over the bad one is very weak. It's at most of the order of the, the energy advantage relative to kT. And that's only of the order of 10 to the minus 4. As a matter of fact, it turns out for technical reasons, you should actually use not T, but the Fermi temperature 
and then it becomes even smaller. So anyway, the so the expectation value of the dipole energy on this simple picture is far, far too small. And this is what really puzzled me, and I lay in bed for I think three weeks at night trying to uh, lie, lie, lie awake trying to think how on earth this could happen. And finally it occurred to me there was a way it could happen. And let's go to the next um, slide for that. So what I came up with was an idea which I called rather clumsily spontaneously broken spin orbit symmetry, SPSOS. And to explain this um, this mechanism, let me take an analogy. The analogy is with a ferromagnetic material. In a ferromagnet, we have a whole set of electrons which have um, small spins which carry magnetic moments. Um, so uh, there are two terms, or two important terms, in the Hamiltonian of this system. There's a term which has uh, only to do with the, uh, the interaction of the electrons with one another. And that we'll call H sub zero, and that is invariant under the simultaneous rotation of all spins. And the se second term, the Zeeman term, um, and that's uh, given by the next formula down. So that's h sub z. If you go to perhaps the next, um, uh, h sub z is minus b sub b. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And you see that breaks the spin rotation symmetry. It tries to orient the spins parallel to the external field. Now, in the paramagnetic phase, when T is uh, above the Curie temperature, <laughs> The spins will basically behave independently, and the thermal energy will compete with the Zeeman energy, and that means that the degree of polarization um, will be the degree to which um, orientation of a given spin along the magnetic field rather than opposed to it is favoured. That polarization is going to be of the order of the Zeeman energy divided by uh, the thermal energy which is much less than one typically. And that means the expectation value of the Zeeman energy is going to be n times the Zeeman energy squared divided by kT. So far so good. Now what happens when I go below the, the Curie temperature into the ferromagnetic phase? Well, um, what happens is that the H0, although it's um, although it's invariant under rotation of all, all the spins simultaneously, what it does is to force all the spins to lie parallel to one another. And that's crucial, because what, what it, that now means is that to, to, to think of the, to work out the polarization, you have to compare a state in which all the spins, or most of them, are lying parallel to the external field, and one in which they're all lying antiparallel. And the energy difference of those two states is not the Zeeman energy, the simple particle Zeeman energy, mu b times h, but rather the, um, that multiplied by n. And n times the Zeeman energy is much larger than k2. So as a result, you get an almost perfect polarization. Uh, almost all the spins line up parallel to the field rather than antiparallel. And as a result, the expectation value of the Zeeman energy is now macroscopic. It's of, of um, order, well, it's, it's of order n, n mu b h rather than n mu b h squared over kt as it was in the, uh, in the paramagnetic phase. So that's something we understood for a long time. Now let's um, try to make an analogy in the case of helium 3. In the case of helium 3, what we have is a um, large term. Uh, H0, which is invariant under relative rotation of the spin and orbital coordinate um, systems. Um, and uh, then we have uh, H sub d, which is the dipole dipole interaction term. And very crudely speaking, that's, um, it's, uh, yeah, see, I should that I, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, it's given by this ex expression uh, here. Um, and what I want you to, to focus on is the fact that that does depend on the orientation of the spins relative to the orbital coordinates. And therefore, if you uh, 
which is slightly righted relative to the orbital angular momentum. Um, now, um, in the normal phase, um, at temperatures, say, of the order of um, a degree or p hundredths, 100 milledegrees, um, the, um, the spins basically depend, behave um, independently, and, and so the piezoelectric spins also behave independently. And so, by the argument I already gave you, the polarization is of the order of this uh, g sub d, um, which uh, divided by kt, and that, as we already saw, is very tiny compared to one, and therefore the expectation value of h, which has another factor of g sub d in it, is of order minus n g sub d squared over kt, and that is very tiny. Um, in fact, it's so tiny that it's only fairly recently that people have been able to measure that effect in the normal phase. But now suppose we go into the um, ordered phase below T sub A. Then what we can imagine, and this is a conjecture at this stage, what we can imagine is that H sub zero will force all, all the pairs, not all single particles now, but all the pairs of particles to behave similarly. So now KT will be competing, not with G sub D, the single, uh, single pair orientation energy, but with N times that. And therefore, the expectation value of the dipole energy can be of the order, or not of G sub D, but of N sub G, G sub, oh, sorry, not of order N G D squared over KT as it was in the normal phase, but rather N times G D, just of the order of 10 to the minus three oogs per cubic centimeter, what's needed to explain the experimental resonance shift. So that at least was quite satisfying. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, just a note on uh, SBSOS. It's actually quite a subtle form of, of, um, uh, of ordering, as we can see by comparing it with the behavior of a ferromagnet. In a ferromagnet, you only have one type of spins, that, that's the uh, uh, angular momentum, rather, that is the, um, the intrinsic electron spin. In the normal phase, the spins are completely disordered. And now if we go down to the ordered phase, they all tend to line up parallel. Um, but now in the case of um, helium uh, three, it's slightly more subtle. The, um, in helium three, you have two different kinds of angular momentum, the spin angular momentum of a pair and its orbital angular momentum. So I denote the spins by red arrows and the orbital angular momentum by green arrows. And so in the normal phase, you see, first of all, the red arrows are uh, completely oriented at random. The green arrows are completely oriented at random. But there's something else. The relative orientation of the green and red arrows is, is also random in the normal phase. Now, if we go into the ordered phase, in particular the B phase, um, it uh, uh, turns out that the uh, the spins are always are still completely random. The orbital angular momentum is still completely random, but the relative orientation of the spins and orbital angular momentum is always the same. It's always this angle of rotation around the uh, particular axis. So uh, yeah, if we can just go a little further down. Yeah. Um, in the, uh, so in the case of a ferromagnet, in the ordered phase, we have the simple situation that the total spin polarization is non-zero. In the B phase of helium-3, what, what you find is that the, um, the average value of the spin is zero, the average value of the orbital angular momentum is zero, but the, orbital, the average of the vector cross product, L cross S, is not zero. And that's a very fascinating state of affairs. If we have time, we can explore some of the consequences of that. Um, no idea for time. Um, okay, I'm getting a little close to time, so perhaps I should try to speed up a bit. Um, okay, so uh, next slide, please. So anyway, there was, well, what that showed was that at least it was not unthinkable that 
um, the standard quantum mechanics and standard statistical mechanics, if co correctly applied, could give you, at least qualitatively, the, the magnetic resonance phenomena that you saw that uh, the Cornell group was seeing in Helium 3. However, um, that still left, uh, left one without a microscopic theory. And moreover, it didn't do anything to resolve the paradox of the of two new phases. That is, remember that in BCS theory, the A phase, which is apparently equal spin pairing, that should never have been stated. And in fact, experimentally, it seldom is. And this was resolved by a very beautiful idea by Anderson Brinkman in the spring of um, 1973. Um, and um, they pointed out there's a crucial difference between Cooper pairing in superconductors and in, uh, in uh, superfluid liquid helium-3. In a superconductor, the effective interaction, the effective attraction, which forms the Cooper pairs, is due to exchange of a lattice vibration. That's nothing really directly to do with the electrons. It's to do with the ions. So the lattice vibrations themselves are pretty much insensitive to the onset of pairing between the electrons. In other words, so this mechanism of attraction is more or less left unchanged when you go into the superconducting phase. By contrast, in liquid helium-3, it's believed, and this is work which had been done um, in the uh, um, uh, mid-60s um, by various people um, using a sort of spin polarization idea. Um, people have figured that a lot of the attraction between two helium-3 atoms would come out of spin fluctuations of the helium-3 atom uh, system. But that, that's a fluctuation of the helium-3 itself. So it's sensitive to the onset of pairing. Um, and this means you can get feedback effects by forming the pairs, you actually change the mechanism which forms them. And it, uh, you actually do a quantitative calculation, as Anderson and Wentman did. Uh, and what they found was remarkable. Over most of the phase diagram, indeed, the baryon work of a state is stable, as in BCS theory. But at higher pressure, feedback effects uniquely favour the ABM phase. And this is a major qualitative leap beyond BCS. And uh, a really new idea, I think, like we have learned from the new phases. So at this point, um, things seem to be in sort of relatively good shape. We had uh, had a qualitative, at least qualitative, and even a quantitative idea of um, which uh, said, okay, the A phase is probably the ABM phase. Theory of the NMR dynamics. Um, and we still saw many other things we don't understand. Oh dear, I have, am I being heard all right? Because there's a notice which has just appeared saying my internet connection is. Um, I'm okay? Is, is yeah, 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 you're okay. We lost you for a second, but you are back with us. Okay, good. Okay, fine. So I guess I ought to probably try to conclude fairly soon, but let me just go on um, to the next slide, which if I'm not, oh uh, yeah, okay. I, I, I really um, probably need to skim, skim through this fairly rapidly. Um, this is the uh, microscopic theory of the spin dynamics, which I actually formulated a few months later than my original thoughts about um, spontaneously broken spin orbit symmetry. When I was when I went to Cornell for a month to interact with the experimentalists, and that was incredibly productive. And so I managed to get out a microscopic theory of the spin dynamics. And um, the, um, well, to cut, cut a long story short, the outcome of that was that the linear NMR behavior was completely determined by the eigenvalues of a particular second derivative of the dipole energy with respect to simultaneous twisting of all the spins relative to the orbital angular momentum. And so that allowed us to fingerprint the A and B phases by NMR and, uh, the, um, uh, the upshot is that we could unambiguously identify the A phase as the ABM phase, which is indeed what Anderson and Brinkman had postulated. Um, and moreover, we can identify the B phase as the BW phase, at least as regards the, the NMR experiments which had been done up to that point. 
but there is actually a subtlety in the BW phase. Um, you remember that in the BW phase, the spins are, relative, are rotated relative to the orbital angular momentum by um, a, a particular angle, and it turns out that angle is about 104 degrees, and that usually that rotation is around an axis whose best choice is the external field. A very analog peculiar result. It turns out that what that means is that you would not expect any shift in the transverse resonance, which indeed is what's seen experimentally. However, if you do the uh, longitudinal resonance, if you do a longitudinal resonance, which no one had previously done in PW3, in which you have an RF field parallel to the external field, not perpendicular, then what you'd expect is a finite frequency longitudinal resonance. Uh, also, you'd expect that in the ABM phase, but it's most spectacular in the BW phase. And sure enough, that was found. And I think that more, pretty much convinced people that the theory of NMR, which I'd uh, worked out, was along the right general lines. So let me just, I think I have one more slide which I can show before I run out of time. So one more slide, please. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so by the summer of 1973, um, both um, uh, uh, a priori consideration and, and oh, sorry, I think it should be 1974 actually. I always get my my um, uh, my years <laughs> mixed up actually. Um, but both a priori stability considerations, uh, as Anderson and Whitney, and NMR experimental data, they're consistent with the hypothesis that both knee phases are pre-prepared and therefore presumably superfluid phases. In fact, people started talking about superfluid helium-3 long before there was actually any explicit evidence for superfluidity. There was evidence for pre-preparing, but no evidence that the resulting paired state could be superfluid. More specifically, we could say by that time that the A phase is very likely the ABM phase, the B phase is very likely the BW phase. So just do very briefly, what is superfluid helium-3 good for? Well, I think it's the most sophisticated, at least until the advent about 10 years later of the fractional quantum Hall effect, superfluid helium-3 was the most sophisticated physical system of which you could claim a detailed quantitative understanding. And all sorts of ideas which were evolved in the helium-3 context were then applied later, for example, to high temperature superconductors. There are all sorts of analogies which people have tried to exploit with systems of particle physics and cosmology. Uh, Volovic, uh, Bishop Volovic in particular, has um, emphasized that. Um, you can use it uh, for studies of some important aspects of turbulence. What I just want to say br a brief word about is the amplification of ultra weak effects. Basically, the NMR is already, the NMR behavior is already a, a manifestation of the amplification of an ultra weak effect by the phenomenon of Cooper pairing and the fact that the Cooper pairs all have to do the same thing at the same time. Um, so let me take the example of uh, looking for a, an effect of the neutral current part of the weak interaction, which violates P parity, but not T, time reversal. You can't get such an effect in a single elementary particle because any electric dipole moment must be proportional to the only characteristic angular momentum, which is J. And that then violates both T and P. However, for helium 3b, you can actually form the product L cross S, and that amazingly violates P, but not T. And therefore, you might imagine get a very tiny electric dipole moment along the, the axis of rotation of S relative to L. Now, um, uh, let me emphasize this is a very, very tiny effect. You've got to say you start off by the um, you start off at the elementary particle level and then you have to go through the atomic level, through the level of molecular physics and finally to the level of Cooper pairs. And by the time you've done all that, uh, the effect magnitude below what one would ever dream of seeing experimentally. However, in the B phase, remember that all the pairs have exactly the same value of L cross S. So you're multiplying that small effect by a factor of about 10 to the 23, and it's still pretty small, but it's not so small that you might 
um, despair forever, forever, ever finding it. And indeed, um, at the time in the um, uh, in in the mid seventies, um, I um, did uh, I did suggest to a few experimental groups they might look for that, but they eventually decided that uh, they just didn't have the resolution at that time. More recently, one or two groups have become interested again, and I I really want to hope that. Um, well, at least one group will actually look for this um, uh, this effect. It would be, I think, the the first real evidence for a macroscopic effect of the parity violation, which occurs at the level of single elementary particles. And I think that would be really rather cute, but it, so far no one's done it. Anyway, um, so the basic message I uh, um, want to try to put across is that the spectacular effects which you see in helium-3, of, of, of which the best known is the NMR, but there are many others, they result from the fact that Cooper pairs are formed and all those Cooper pairs have to behave in exactly the same way at the same time. Thank you. Oh yeah, okay, yes, you can just show those, um, uh, those uh, uh, slides. This, this is a slide of the Nobel Medal, and uh, we have the, I think, yes, the certificate, and then finally, we have the artist's uh, artist representation of Cooper pairs, which I rather like. Uh, like yes. uh, this one, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Green cherries. <laughs> uh, uh, so, I don't so, think Cooper pairs or anything like that. But <laughs> <laughs> so, Tony, thank you very much for this fantastic talk. Uh, so, 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 shall we thank uh, Tony uh, before going to questions? Uh, thank you very much, Tony. Okay. <laughs> So we have time for, uh, for, for some questions. Uh, so if somebody has some questions, uh, please just raise your hand or unmute your microphone and ask directly to Tony, please. Go ahead. Some questions? Uh, uh, Salvador, adelante. Pero tu micrófono, your microphone doesn't work. Let me see, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, yes, I can hear you oh. too. Oh, uh, Professor Adenet, thank you very much for this uh, enlightening lecture for all the, the uh, steps you followed and in, in, in important ideas you device for uh, explaining this uh, phase transition effects in superheat fluidity and helium-3. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what do you think about uh, the case of uh, nano droplets, helium-3 nano droplets? Uh, do you think uh, still, the, the superfluidity properties are kept at the same level of uh, uh, nano size of these mm. nanofluid droplets. Yeah, I think that would my my theoretical uh, expectation would be that it that would depend um, rather strongly on the size of the droplets. And I think my first guess would be that um, you would have to have a droplet. Uh, which is at least as large as the pair radius, the radius of the Cooper pairs at that um, temperature and so forth. And I suspect that most of the nano droplets which people are looking at experimentally don't satisfy that condition. However, there is a, a, a um, further point, a more complicated point. In a superconductor, it is not actually necessary for existence of the superconductor to state that yes. the um, grain size be large compared to the pair radius. In yes. fact, it can really be much smaller than that and you can still get a recognizably superconducting state formed. Is that the case with um, helium-3? Well, the problem is that typically anisotropic superfluids um, or anisotropic Cooper paired states are much yes. more sensitive to boundary conditions than the ordinary BCS state. So I think my instinct would still be that it's unlikely that you would see much evidence for superfluidity in droplets which are small compared to the pair radius. However, if you can tell me I'm wrong, I'd be very interested. No, no, no. I was just thinking about this L, uh, L cross S average value, yeah. uh, which uh, perhaps could be uh, size independent and maybe it could really uh, uh, define some characteristics when you have a very uh, small sizes for, uh, let's say, not not a bulk 
bulk uh, type of behavior, but uh, your, your last slide uh, in the presentation made me think about this uh, key violation uh, term that uh, you mentioned. And uh, I'm not, I don't know if I, I'm not expert in this field, but I, I just that made me think about these uh, mm -hmm. uh, properties. Well, yes, that I think it's, it's sort of a possibility. Um, again, I think my um, my instinct would tend to be that um, the B phase probably will not form as, as easily in a small droplet as it will in, in, in bulk. Um, that seems to be the case uh, when you uh, impose other kinds of boundary conditions. For example, there have been a lot of experiments um, on helium-3 in both Vicor and Aerogel, where you have um, very severe constraints due to the solid uh, boundaries. And generally speaking, we find that uh, the B phase is not so favoured as it, as it is in, in bulk. Um, but frankly, I haven't kept up with the field of, of droplets in the last um, few years. And so I would need to, to actually go back and look up the orders of magnitude and so forth. As, as regards this um, parity violation effect, I'm afraid that uh, it would, even if the B phase does occur in uh, small droplets, it would probably would not be very easy to see that effect because even in bulk, um, even if I have a, a, a sample of the order of several cubic centimeters of helium-3, which is about all that anyone will ever let me uh, acquire these days, um, I still don't, um, uh, 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 it's still extremely difficult, perhaps impossible, to see this effect. So I, I think um, going to um, small droplets would probably not be, in that case, the right direction. Well, thank you very much, Professor Leggett. It has been a honor to listen to your beautiful lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Salvador, and thank you, Tony, for uh, for answer. Uh, more questions, colleagues? Please uh, raise your hand. Uh, uh, so let me see, because I have two computers in front of me. So Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia, if you have a question, please, uh, would you mind to unmute your mic microphone and ask directly? Is that okay? Can you do it? Yes, yes, yes. So I, told, I couldn't use my microphone. So Professor Leggett, thank you for your fantastic talk. It was fantastic. I, I do research in MRI imaging things for magnetic resonance. So I know that the Nobel Prize, Paul Lauterbuch, was from the same university. Yeah. So I have a curiosity. Uh, is there was a relation of research between you of two working on this uh, in this area because the superconductive uh, magnets are very vital for the MRI research? Yeah, no, actually, I'm afraid I have to say there's really no relation. And in fact, the um, when I when I did the particular research, which the Nobel Committee eventually recognised, I was actually not at the University of Illinois. I was at the University of Sussex in the in the UK. Um, I had, in fact, had a brief stay at the University of Illinois, and uh, I can say that much of my understanding of the theory of superconductivity or superfluidity did derive from that stay. But at that time, uh, Paul Lauterbaugh was not around. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, more questions? A couple of more questions before uh, uh, we conclude the, the seminar of today. Oh, yes, if, uh, if may I, Isaac? Of course, yeah, Adrian, please go ahead. Yes, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Leggett, for this uh, talk. It was very, very nice uh, explanation of this fantastic phenomena. And the question is uh, a little bit technical. Uh, I saw uh, this semi-classical equation of motion in the microscopic spin dynamics. Can you just, uh, just for my education, uh, how you get these uh, equations, what you call semi-classical equation of motion? Yeah. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, um, that's historically interesting because um, it actually, the way I actually got to them was that I had, um, when I was a postdoc um, at the University of Kyoto in Japan in 1965, a few years before this happened, I had actually tried to produce a theory of two band superconductors. Um, and I had um, written down a theory which involved the uh, two, uh, uh, two simple variables. One was the number imbalance between the two bands, 
and the other was the world of foam, and the two compared in the two ways. At the time, that seemed um, uh, that, that seemed a waste of work because uh, of the experiments on which I, which I was uh, based with, uh, which I motivated this calculation, uh, turned out to have been wrong. But, um, uh, but I had actually done that calculation. And so, yeah, what you do is to um, define a, um, uh, two quantities. One is the, the ordinary total spin, uh, which is, of course, a three dimensional vector. And the other um, yeah. is this um, a quantity, which uh, I would call the spin of the pupa pair. So that's a rather subtle concept. Um, the, it's tempting to think that if I've got a, so let's I'll say my, my superfluid is zero temperature, and I, it is actually pupa paired. Uh, and so, in some sense, all the atoms are playing a role in the pupa pairing. Um, however, um, if, for example, I put on a magnetic field, I can induce a, a total spin polarization. And I can also uh, uh, induce a certain value of the pupa pair spins. But the, the, the tricky thing is these two are not the same. The, uh, the, 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 if I talk about the spin of the pupa of pairs, it's in some sense a measure of the extent to which the spins which form a pupa of pair are correlated. So I do have to define it quite carefully, and I can do that. Um, in fact, in my uh, uh, original paper, um, I did that in terms of the um, second quantization operation and the creation operators. But the, the crucial point is that it is not that 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 quantity, which I put uh, capital T, it's also uh, bold face capital T, it's also a vector. It's not the same as the, uh, the total spin, and they do have an interesting um, commutation relation. I forget what I actually wrote down there. If we could just go back for a moment to the, the slide in question, which is the microscopic spin dynamics. Yes. Two slides back. We could actually take a look, and I could yeah. see if I actually defined that quantity T. In that oh, yeah. slide explicitly. Okay. Uh, back, back, back. Uh, yeah, here we are. Here we go. Yes. Yeah, quite. So I've actually simplified a bit um, by, uh, I've actually chosen not the actual vector t, but rather its direction. So, um, uh, so, uh, so, I mean, to, to make this uh, totally intelligible, of course, I would have to um, write out. Uh, what exactly I mean by the orientation of the spin of the pairs. I can do that, but I can't do it in my head as it were. <laughs> and it wouldn't make sense to try to do it on this slide. But it right. is in my, my original paper. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andriana. Thank you, Tony. Uh, one more question. Uh, if uh, nobody has one more question, uh, maybe I have one myself. Otherwise, uh, so then, uh, Tony, let me ask you one question. I, I love your seminar. It was very clear, particularly because I have to follow and I have to share the presentations. I have to pay very close attention. I, I was I was very surprised when you uh, when you mentioned because I, well, I guess it is it is important from a historical point of view that you thought when you uh, when you look at, at these experiments that it might uh, it might be that uh, a quantum mechanics broke down at that time. So. Looking nowadays at the state of the art of you know uh, modern condensed matter physics, uh, do you have a hint or some experiment or something that may uh, give an idea of some breakdown of quantum mechanics? Or now you think that this quantum mechanics is a very robust theory, and mm -hmm. maybe our task is not to understand other other stuff like a, you know collapse of the wave function, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Well, when I first started, uh, I eventually got back to the foundation of the quantum mechanics around 1980. And at that point, um, I started thinking about experiments which one might do um, on, for example, superconducting devices to, to bring the predictions of quantum mechanics much closer to our every, level of everyday life. And, uh, and if you had told me at that point in, say, 1980, that people were doing ex experiments at the level that they're now doing them with so-called flux qubits and related things, and asked me to bet on the um, probability that um, quantum mechanics would still be working 
at that scale, I think I'd only given you a sort of fifty percent bit. <laughs> now I, I guess I have to be a lot more conservative, uh, obviously. Um, but it's only relatively recently that we've been able to do experiments which not only show that everything is consistent with quantum mechanics, but also show, which I think is very important, that the, 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 the world, as it were, is not consistent with a particular set of hypotheses at the macroscopic level. The idea that uh, at least whatever may happen at the microscopic scale, at the level of superconducting devices and so forth, um, they are always definitely in one state or the other, and not in some kind of quantum superposition. And so everything is consistent with them, uh, has been consistent for 20 years with them being in a superposition. But we've never been able to prove that the opposite cannot be true. And that's something we may, we, we, uh, uh, we achieved, at least I claim we achieved about five years ago, in fact. So now we know that so called, what I call macro realism, is not valid, at least at the level of Swiss. What I would like to see is actually some extension of that, um, uh, this, this line of, of, of uh, research. And in particular, I would love to see a so called EPR Bell experiment conducted between two astronauts in spaceships um, separated by more than, let's say, two or three light seconds. Sure. This would really knock out a whole lot of um, possible interpretations of the, the collapse um, postures and so forth in quantum mechanics. I see, I see. Uh, well, uh, Tony, uh, I, I would love to, to give you more, uh, to ask you more questions, but uh, so, so, so let us uh, leave it for another occasion, okay? So colleagues, uh, shall we thank uh, Tony for this fantastic talk one more time? Thank you, Tony. So once again, thank you very much, Tony. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for attending this uh, seminar series. Uh, now it's time for a summer break. So enjoy the holidays yes. and see you back in August. Once again, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tony. Okay. See you all. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Recording stopped. Hemos dejado de grabar.